welcome kindred spirits to a place of positivity, passion, and purpose. Welcome to our video on Sigrid Unzit. We're thrilled to have you here. Sigrid Unzit, 20 May 1882 10 June 1949, was a Danish born Norwegian novelist. She was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1928. Born in Denmark and raised in Norway, Unzit had her first books of historical fiction published in 1907. She fled Norway for the United States in 1940 because of her opposition to Nazi Germany and the German invasion and occupation of Norway, but returned after World War I, I ended in 1945. Her best-known work is Kristin Lavrensatter, a trilogy about life in Norway in the Middle Ages, portrayed through the experiences of a woman from birth until death. Its three volumes were published between 1920 and 1922. Let's now turn our attention to early life and uncover the fascinating insights it brings to the table. Sigrid Unzit was born on 20 May 1882 in the small town of Kalundborg, Denmark, at the childhood home of her mother, Charlotte Unzit, and Anna Maria Charlotte Gibb. Unzit was their eldest of three daughters. She and her family moved to Norway when she was two. She grew up in the Norwegian capital, Oslo or Kristinia, as it was known until 1925. When she was only 11 years old, her father, the Norwegian archaeologist Ingvald Martin Unzit, died at the age of 40 after a long illness. The family's economic situation meant that Unzit had to give up hope of a university education and after a one-year secretarial course she obtained work at the age of 16 as a secretary with an engineering company in Christiania, a post she was to hold for 10 years. She joined the Norwegian Authors Union in 1907 and from 1933 through 1935 headed its literary council, eventually serving as the union's chairwoman from 1936 until 1940. As we move forward, let's uncover the untold stories and fascinating intricacies of writer. While employed at office work, Unzit wrote and studied. She was 16 years old when she made her first attempt at writing a novel set in the Nordic Middle Ages. The manuscript, a historical novel set in medieval Denmark, was ready by the time she was 22. It was turned down by the publishing house. Nonetheless, two years later, she completed another manuscript, much less voluminous than the first at only 80 pages. She had put aside the Middle Ages and had instead produced a realistic description of a woman with a middle-class background in contemporary Christiania. This book was also refused by the publishers at first but it was subsequently accepted. The title was Fru Marta Alley, and the opening sentence the words of the book's main character scandalist readers, I have been unfaithful to my husband. Thus, at the age of 25, Unzit made her literary debut with a short realistic novel on adultery, set against a contemporary background. It created a stir, and she found herself ranked as a promising young author in Norway. During the years up to 1919, Unzit published a number of novels set in contemporary Christiania. Her contemporary novels of the period are about the city and its inhabitants. They are stories of working people, of trivial family destinies, of the relationship between parents and children. Her main subjects are women and their love. Or, as she herself put it in her typically curt and ironic manner femoral kind of love. This realistic period culminated in the novels Jenny 1911 and Vine Spring 1914. The first is about a woman painter who, as a result of romantic crises, believes that she is wasting her life, and, in the end, commits suicide. The other tells of a woman who succeeds in saving both herself and her love from a serious matrimonial crisis, finally creating a secure family. These books placed Unzit apart from the incipient women's emancipation movement in Europe. Unzit's books sold well from the start, and, after the publication of her third book, she left her office job and prepared to live on her income as a writer. Having been granted a writer's scholarship, she set out on a lengthy journey in Europe. After short stops in Denmark and Germany, she continued to Italy, arriving in Rome in December 1909, where she remained for nine months. 
Unset's parents had had a close relationship with Rome, and during her stay there, she followed in their footsteps. The encounter with Southern Europe meant a great deal to her. She made friends within a circle of Scandinavian artists and writers in Rome. Our focus now turns to marriage and children, an important aspect of our discussion. In Rome, Unzid met Anders Castus Svarsted, a Norwegian painter, whom she married almost three years later. She was 30, Svarsted was 13 years older, married, and had a wife and three children in Norway. It was nearly three years before Svarsted got his divorce from his first wife. Unzit and Svarsted were married in 1912 and went to stay in London for six months. From London, they returned to Rome, where their first child was born in January 1913. A boy, he was named after his father. In the years up to 1919, she had another child, and the household also took in Svarsted's three children from his first marriage. These were difficult years, her second child, a girl, was mentally handicapped, as was one of Svarstad's sons by his first wife. She continued writing, finishing her last realistic novels and collections of short stories. She also entered the public debate on topical themes, women's emancipation and other ethical and moral issues. She had considerable polemical gifts, and was critical of emancipation as it was developing, and of the moral and ethical decline she felt was threatening in the wake of the First World War. In 1919, she moved to Lillehammer, a small town in the Gudbrand Valley in southeast Norway, taking her two children with her. She was then expecting her third child. The intention was that she should take a rest at Lillehammer and move back to Christiania as soon as Fasted had their new house in order. However, the marriage broke down and a divorce followed. In August 1919, she gave birth to her third child, at Lillehammer. She decided to make Lillehammer her home, and within two years, Jokk, a large house of traditional Norwegian timber architecture, was completed, along with a large fenced garden with views of the town and the villages around. Here she was able to retreat and concentrate on her writing. Brace yourself for an enlightening exploration of Kristin Laveren's Data Trilogy and the Master of Hesviken Tetralogy as we dive into its profound implications. After the birth of her third child, and with a secure roof over her head, Unzit started a major project, Kristin Laveren's Data. She was at home in the subject matter, having written a short novel at an earlier stage about a period in Norwegian history closer to the pre-Christian era. She had also published a Norwegian retelling of the Arthurian legends. She had studied Old Norse manuscripts and medieval chronicles and visited and examined medieval churches and monasteries, both at home and abroad. She was now an authority on the period she was portraying and a very different person from the 22-year-old who had written her first novel about the Middle Ages. It was only after the end of her marriage that Unzit wrote her masterpiece. In the years between 1920 and 1927, she first published the three-volume Christin, and then the four-volume of Orbanson, swiftly translated into English as the Master of Hestviken. Simultaneously with this creative process, she was engaged in trying to find meaning in her own life, finding the answer in God. Unzit experimented with modernist tropes such as stream of consciousness in her novel, although the original English translation by Charles Archer excised many of these passages. In 1997, the first volume of Tyner Nunnally's new translation of the work won the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction in the category of translation. The names of each volume were translated by Archer as the Bridal Wreath, the Mistress of Husaby, and the Cross, and by Nunnally as the Wreath the wife, and the cross. Subsequent translation of the Hesviken Tetralogy by Nunnally R. Rittitled of Audence and of Owls the Axe, Providence, The Snake Pit, Crossroads in the Wilderness, and Winter the Sun Avenger. Our focus now turns to Catholicism, an important aspect of our discussion. Both Unset's parents were atheists and, although, in accord with the norm of the day, she and her two younger sisters were Baptist and with their mother regularly attended the local Lutheran church, the milieu in which they were raised was a thoroughly secular one. 
Unzit spent much of her life as an agnostic, but marriage and the outbreak of the First World War were to change her attitudes. During those difficult years she experienced a crisis of faith, almost imperceptible at first, then increasingly strong. The crisis led her from clear agnostic skepticism, by way of painful uneasiness about the ethical decline of the age, towards Christianity. In all her writing, one senses an observant eye for the mystery of life and for that which cannot be explained by reason or the human intellect. At the back of her sober, almost brutal realism, there is always an inkling of something unanswerable. At any rate, this crisis radically changed her views and ideology. Whereas she had once believed that man created God, she eventually came to believe that God created man. Beginning around 1917, Unzit developed a passionate interest in the writings of Monsignor Robert Hugh Benson, many of whose writings she was to translate into Norwegian. However, she did not turn to the established Lutheran Church of Norway, where she had been nominally reared. This is because, according to Jaya Halsens, Unzit had always considered the Lutheran Church anemic and detested the fact that every minister seemed to preach his personal version of Lutheranism. She was received into the Catholic Church in November 1924, after thorough instruction from the Catholic priest in her local parish. She was 42 years old. She subsequently became a lay Dominican. It is noteworthy that the Master of Hesviken, written immediately after Unset's conversion, takes place in a historical period when Norway was Catholic, that it has very religious themes of the main character's relations with God and his deep feeling of sin and that the medieval Catholic Church is presented in a favourable light, with virtually all clergy and monks in the series being positive characters. In Norway, Unset's conversion to Catholicism was not only considered sensational, it was scandalous. It was also noted abroad, where her name was becoming known through the international success of Kristin Laveren's data. At the time, there were very few practising Catholics in Norway, which was an almost exclusively Lutheran country. Anti-Catholicism was widespread not only among the Lutheran clergy, but through large sections of the population. Likewise, there was just as much anti-Catholic scorn among the Norwegian intelligentsia, many of whom were adherents of socialism and communism. The attacks against her faith and character were quite vicious at times, with the result that Unset's literary gifts were aroused in response. For many years, she participated in the public debate, going out of her way to introduce the ongoing Catholic literary revival into Norwegian literature. In response, she was swiftly dubbed the Mistress of Jerk and the Catholic Lady. Unset's essays about Elizabethan era English Catholic martyrs Margaret Clitheroe and Robert Southwell were collected and published in Stages on the Road. Furthermore, Unset's Saga of Saints told the whole of Norwegian history through the lives of Norwegian saints and venerables. In May 1928, Unset travelled to England and visited G.K. Chesterton and Hille Belloc, both of whose writings she was later to translate into Norwegian. According to legend, Unset once walked into the office of the manager of the monolithic Asherhau Publishing Company. Unzit then threw a copy of Chesterton's The Everlasting Man on the manager's desk and exclaimed, This is the best book ever written. It has to be translated into Norwegian. Whether or not the story is merely apocryphal, Unset's own translation of The Everlasting Man was published in 1931. Get ready for an exciting exploration as we unravel the mysteries of later life. At the end of this creative eruption, Unzit entered Connell Waters. After 1929, she completed a series of novels set in contemporary Oslo, with a strong Catholic element. She selected her themes from the small Catholic community in Norway. But here also, the main theme is love. She also published a number of weighty historical works which put the history of Norway into a sober perspective. In addition, she translated several Icelandic sagas into modern Norwegian and published a number of literary essays, mainly on English literature, of which a long essay on the Bront sisters, and one on D. H. Lawrence, are especially worth mentioning. In 1934, she published 11 years old, an autobiographical work. With a minimum of camouflage, 
It tells the story of her own childhood in Christinia, of her home, rich in intellectual values and love, and of her sick father. At the end of the Urs, she commenced work on a new historical novel set in 18th century Scandinavia. Only the first volume, Madame Dorothea, was published in 1939. The Second World War broke out that same year and proceeded to break her, both as a writer and as a woman. She never completed her new novel. When Joseph Stalin's invasion of Finland touched off the Winter War, Unzit supported the Finnish war effort by donating her Nobel Prize on 25 January 1940. Let's transition to exile and uncover its significance. When Germany invaded Norway in April 1940, Unzit was forced to flee. She had strongly criticised both Nazi ideology and Adolf Hitler since the early years, and, from an early date, her books were banned in Nazi Germany. She accordingly knew her name was on a list of those to be rounded up in the first wave of arrests and had no wish to become a target of the Gestapo. She accordingly fled to neutral Sweden. Her eldest son, Norwegian Army 2nd Lieutenant Anders Svarsted, was killed in action at the age of 27, on 27 April 1940, while defending Segelstad Bridge in Dissel from German troops. Unset's sick daughter had died shortly before the outbreak of the war. Jerk was requisitioned by the Wehrmacht, and used as officers' quarters throughout the occupation of Norway. Unset's library had already been secretly divided between her closest local friends. The books were hidden at great risk throughout the Nazi occupation and were returned to her after the liberation of Norway. In 1940, Unzit and her younger son left neutral Sweden then crossed the Soviet Union via the Trans-Siberian Railroad before arriving as a political refugee in the United States. There, she untiringly pleaded occupied Norway's cause and the plight of European Jews in writings, speeches and interviews. She lived in Brooklyn Heights, New York. She was active in Street Arts by Scandinavian Catholic League and wrote several articles for its bulletin. She also travelled to Florida, where she became a close friend of novelist Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings. Following the Gestapo's arrest and summary execution of Danish Lutheran pastor and playwright Kamunk on 4 January 1944, the Danish resistance newspaper De Freidansk printed protests from many famous Scandinavian intellectuals, including Unzit. In the following section, we'll be immersing ourselves in the captivating world of return to Norway and death. Unzit returned to Norway after the liberation in 1945. She lived another four years but never published another word. Unzit died at 67 in Lillehammer, Norway, where she had lived from 1919 through 1940. She was buried in the village of Mesnerli. 15 kilometers east of Lillehammer, where also her daughter and the son who died in battle are remembered. The grave is recognizable by three black crosses. Let's now turn our attention to honors and uncover the fascinating insights it brings to the table. Unzit won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1928, for which she was nominated by Helga Eng, member of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters. A Mountain on the Moon east of Crater Lambert at Merimbrium, was called Mans Unzit. However, it was erroneously mentioned as Mans Undist on lunar topographic orthophoto map herb. The International Astronomical Union IAU refused to include Mans Unzit in the alphabetic gazetta of officially named lunar formations. This mountain is nowadays known as Lambert Lambert Gamma. A crater on the planet Venus was named after Unzit. Unzit was depicted on a Norwegian 500 kroner note and a 2 kroner postage stamp from 1982. Neighbouring Sweden put her on a stamp in 1998. Jerk, Unzit's home in Lillehammer, is now part of the Mehorgen Museum. The farmhouse was listed in 1983. Efforts to restore and furnish the houses as they were during the time of her occupancy were begun in 1997. New public buildings were opened in May 2007. Unzit is depicted on the tail fin of a Norwegian air shuttle Boeing 737-800, with the registration LNNGY. 
Get ready for a captivating exploration as we unravel the layers of novels and their profound significance. Marta Auli 1907 The Happy Age 1908 Gunner's Daughter is a brief novel set in the Saga Age. This was Unset's first historical novel, published in 1909. Gunner's Daughter, Jenny was written in 1911. It is a story of a Norwegian painter who travels to Rome for inspiration. Things do not turn out as she had expected. Jenny, the unknown Sigrid Unzit, a collection of Unset's early existentialist works, including Tyne and Nunnally's new translation of Jenny was assembled by Tim Page for Sturforth Press and published in 2001. Kristin Laverne's Thatter is a trilogy of three volumes. These are listed in order as well. Written during. In 1995, the first volume was the basis for a commercial film, Kristin Laverne's Data, directed by Liv Ullman. Kristin Laverne's Data, The Wreath. Kristin Laverne's Data, The Wife. Kristin Laverne's Data, The Cross, The Master of Hesviken series is a tetralogy of four volumes, published, which are listed in order below. Depending on the edition, each volume may be printed by itself, or two volumes may be combined into one book. The latter tends to result from older printings and whether the original Norwegian or later English translation. Recent completed or planned retitling Greelies by Tyne and Nunnally, from the University of Minnesota Press, are shown below. The Axe, the Master of Hesviken, retitled in T. Nunnally's revised English translation as Olive Odensen I. Vows. The Snake Pit, the Master of Hesviken retitled in T. Nunnally's revised English translation as Olive Ovenson to Providence. In the Wilderness, The Master of Hestviken, retitled in T. Nunnally's revised English translation as Olive Ovenson III, Crossroads, Plan Availability. The Son Avenger, The Master of Hestviken, retitled in T. Nunnally's revised English translation as Olive Ovenson IV, Winter Not Yet Released. Ida Elizabeth 1932. Ida Elizabeth San Francisco, Ignatius Press, 2011, Stages on the Road is a collection of Saints Libs, with a foreword by Elizabeth Scolia, and published in 2012. The Wild Orchid is a novel set in 20th century Norway and published in 1931. The title is in reference to the garden of the main character's mother. The Burning Bush is a continuation of the novel The Wild Orchid and published in 1932. It examines the conflicts arising in the main character's life after his conversion to Catholicism. Ida Elizabeth 1933. Cassell and Company The Longest Years 1935 The Faithful Wife 1937 Images in a Mirror 1938 Madame Dorthea 1939 First volume of uncompleted novel Catherine of Cena 1951 Sigrid Unset's Catherine of Cena is acclaimed as one of the best biographies of this well-known 14th century saint. Unset based this factual work on primary sources, her own experiences living in Italy and her profound understanding of the human heart. Catherine of Siena was a favourite of Unzit, who, like Catherine, was a third-order Dominican. This novel was republished by Ignatius Press in 2009. Catherine of Siena San Francisco, Ignatius Press, 2009. Brace yourself for an in-depth analysis as we navigate through other works and its far-reaching implications. Men, Women and Places a collection of critical essays, including Blasphemy, D. H. Lawrence, The Strongest Power, and Glastonbury. Ch. Arthur G. Chater, Castle and Company, London. 1939. Happy Times in Norway, a memoir of her children's life in that country before the Nazi occupation, features a particularly moving and powerful preface about the simplicity and hardness of Norway and its people with a vow that it will return thus after the evil of Nazism is swept clean. New York, Alfred Enoch, 1942. True and Untrue and Other Norse Tales, 1945, by Alfred Enoch. Reissued 2012 by Puck Press, hardcover based on the original stories collected by Mo and Asgensen. Saga of Saints. The Coming of Christianity, Street. Sunniva and the Seljemen. Street. 
Olaf, Norway's king to all eternity, Street, Halvard, Street, Madness, Earl of the Orkney Islands, Street, Eystein, Archbishop of Nidaros, Street, Thorfinn, Bishop of Hamar, Father, Karl Schilling, Barnabit. Chapter of this book also published as a priest from Norway, the Venerable Karl M. Schilling, CRSP by the Barnabit Fathers through the North American Voice of Fatima, Young Sound NY, July 1976. Let's now turn our gaze towards other sources and explore the fascinating connections it has to offer. Inside the Gate, Sigrid Unset's Life at Jok by Nan Benson Skill, translated by Tyner Nunnel Bearschmidt, Karl Fahrenheit, 1970. Sigrid Unset. Twain's World Office Series 107. New York, Twain Publishers and Benson Skill, 2018 Inside the Gate. Sigrid Unset's Life at Jerk Biography Translated by Tyner Nunnally University of Minnesota Press Unset, Sigrid, and Deal W. Hudson. Sigrid Unset on Saints and Sinners, New Translations and Studies, Papers Presented at a Conference Sponsored by the Weathersfield Institute, New York City, April 24, 1993. Initius Press, 1993. Don't forget to hit that notification bell so you never miss an update from my channel.